Blimey, where did all this come from? Well, it was a police box, wasn't it? I what are you both doing in here? The TARDIS dematerializes just as Ben and Polly step inside. The Doctor explains that the TARDIS is a ship that travels through time and space, and he has no idea how to fly it. When are we going to land? I don't know. That's the cause of half my trouble through my journeys. I never know. Why not? I have no control over where I land. They arrive on a beach in Cornwall in the 17th century. Ben is sceptical. Well, look, I'll take a little bet with you, eh? London, 1966, Fitzroy Square. But Polly, ever the optimist, loves the idea of being a time traveller. But it's a super place! Whilst Ben heads off to look for a bus stop, the tide comes in, cutting the travellers off from the TARDIS. 17th century? Yes, I'm afraid you're going to lose your bet, young man. Seeking shelter for the night, they arrive at a church and meet a shooty church warden with a dislocated finger. So the doctor plays a quick game of pull my finger and pops it back into place for him. The church warden is very grateful and shares with the doctor a riddle that leads to Captain Avery's cursed treasure. The treasure is apparently hidden somewhere near the church. The travellers are a little bemused by this and they head off to the local inn. Nearby, a bloodthirsty pirate, ironically named Cherub, has been spying on the church warden and tries to get the location of the treasure out of him. But the church warden refuses, a fight ensues, and the church warden ends up brutally murdered. You're a fool, Joe Longfoot, but before you go to join your mates, tell me what I want to know. Speak up! In the village, everyone mistakes Polly for a boy, presumably because she's wearing trousers. I do wish everyone would stop calling me lad. It does make me feel very odd. Since Polly is literally the only woman who appears in this entire story, maybe the villagers had just never seen a woman before. The innkeeper called Cooper gives the travellers a room and some dry clothes, but before they can settle down, the doctor is kidnapped by Cherub the pirate. We're going to have words together, you and me. Get your dirty hands off him, mate. I don't think I've set eyes on you before in my life, man. No, but we have a mutual acquaintance, though. And what do you mean? Joseph Longfoot. Or a church warden. Barely an acquaintance. Was, you mean. You see, him and me, we had a little bit of a tizzy like, mate. <laughs> Cherub and the pirates want the location of Captain Avery's treasure, and now only the Doctor knows where it is, so they kidnap him. Since there's been a murder at the church, the Magistrate arrives and takes Ben and Polly to jail, thinking they're the murderers. The Doctor has been taken to the Black Albatross, a ship belonging to the notorious smuggler and pirate, Captain Pike. Cherub is a member of Pike's crew, and tries to extract the location of the treasure from the Doctor. Sharp as a whistle is. Ever seen a head with no ears, sawbones, eh? Or what them Mexican Indians can do to a bloke's eyelids, eh? Well, that sounds horrible. Let me give him a taste of Thomas Tickler. I dread to think what that would entail. Meanwhile, Ben and Polly come up with a plan to escape prison. And maybe find out who really killed the church warden. But Polly, you already know who killed him. You see, him and me, we had a little bit of a tizzy like, mate. <laughs> To be fair, it has been quite a stressful day for her. Sorry, I mean him. Polly and Ben break out of the jail by pretending that the Doctor is a wizard who's possessed Polly. The superstitious young lad guarding them fears for his life and lets them go. While Captain Pike heads into town to organise an illegal smuggling deal with the corrupt magistrate, the Doctor escapes from the pirate ship by distracting his guard, again pretending to be a fortune teller and playing on his superstitions. This distraction allows another prisoner to bonk the guard on the head. Classic. When Captain Pike gets back, he's obviously not too pleased with his crew for letting the Doctor escape. Fare ye well. Jamaica. Ooh, bloodthirsty. Polly and Ben head back to the church and meet a revenue man, a representative of the King who is investigating reports of piracy and smuggling in this area. Ben does punch him a bit and ties him up, but eventually Mr Blake the Revenue Man is convinced to go and fetch the militia to apprehend the pirates and the corrupt magistrate. The Doctor now arrives at the church and tells Ben and Polly to head back to the TARDIS through a secret smuggler's passage that leads directly from the church to the beach. 
Captain Pike will likely pillage and burn the village before he leaves because, you know, he's a pirate. So the Doctor decides to find the cursed treasure to offer to Pike in exchange for his promise to leave the village alone. Pike arrives at the church and is betrayed by his crewman Cherub, who wants the treasure for himself. Pike's pirate crew are now ashore and stealing the magistrate's smuggled loot. Captain Pike uses his hook hand to kill Cherub and then forces the doctor to find the treasure. But just after finding it, Mr. Blake and the militia arrive and ambush Pike and his men at the church. As the two factions fight, Pike tries to kill the doctor, but the magistrate risks his own life and saves the doctor. The magistrate was a smuggler, but not a murderer. This gives Mr. Blake the opportunity to shoot Pike and the militia finish off the rest of Pike's crew. With the pirates defeated, the doctor slips away down the secret passage in the church and returns to the TARDIS with Ben and Polly. It seems everyone who tried to get Captain Avery's lost treasure ended up dead. So perhaps there was a curse after all. Yes, superstition is a strange thing, my dear, but sometimes it tells the truth. The TARDIS materialises on Earth in 1986, just outside a space rocket tracking station at the Antarctic South Pole. Why build a rocket base at the Antarctic? We don't know. The base is run by General Cutler, an authoritative military man who takes an instant dislike to the Doctor. You'd better have a good explanation. I don't like your tomb, sir. And <laughs> I don't like your face, nor your hair. <laughs> The scientists at the base are trying to safely land a manned space capsule, but the capsule is being pulled off course by the gravitational pull of a planet called Mondas. Mondas has only just arrived in the solar system, and it's heading towards Earth. Mondas is Earth's twin planet, which drifted away from Earth eons ago. Why? We don't know. Now the planet has returned and brought with it the Cybermen. Soon the Antarctic base is invaded by the Cybermen. The Cybermen explain that they were once like humans, but their race was getting weak, so their scientists and doctors devised mechanical spare parts to almost completely replace their bodies. But that means you're not like us. You're robots. Our brains are just like yours, except that certain weaknesses have been removed. Weaknesses? What weaknesses? You call them emotions, do you not? But that's terrible. You, you mean you wouldn't care about someone in pain? There would be no need. We do not feel pain. But we do. Mondas is draining all the Earth's energy. Why? We don't know. It also drains the energy from the space capsule, causing it to explode. The Cybermen apparently want to take everyone to Mondas so that they can be turned into Cybermen too. You will become like us. But we cannot live with you. You're, you're different. You've got no feelings. Feelings? I do not understand that word. Emotions, love, pride, hate, fear. Have you no emotions, sir? Come to Mondas and you will have no need of emotions. Ben grabs a gun and threatens the Cybermen, but it doesn't go well for him. Stop! And he gets locked up in a projector room. He quickly escapes from the projector room, though, by blinding his Cyberman guard with the light from the projector. And then he shoots it with its own weapon. Didn't give an alternative! With the cyber weapon, Ben and General Cutler then overpower the Cybermen and regain control of the base. The Doctor seems frail and weak, and he collapses. But why? We don't know. I don't understand it. He just seems to be worn out. Cutler checks in with his boss at International Space Command in Europe, where we see a multinational group of humans working together to defend the planet from the Cybermen, who are landing all over the Earth. The multinational, multiracial humans here contrast the homogenous Cybermen, who all look and sound the same. The strength of humanity is in its diversity. The energy drain is increasing rapidly. Ouvrez les lignes de communication avec tous les gouvernements. Allez-y. Tout de suite. 
Cutler is informed by Geneva that a second capsule had been launched to help the first, and this space capsule is being piloted by Cutler's own son. To save his son, and the rest of the world, but mainly his son, Cutler decides to use the ultimate weapon of mass destruction, the Z-bomb. What is the Z-bomb? What is it? It's the doomsday weapon, mister, and rightly primed that could split that planet in half. The Z-bomb will completely destroy Mondas, and might take out a significant portion of life on Earth too. That's a risk we'll have to take. Ben and one of the scientists sabotage the Z-bomb so that it can't launch, and Cutler is not happy. <coughs> Cutler is about to shoot the Doctor for interfering with his plan to save his son. But a new wave of Cybermen then arrive and recapture the base and kill Cutler in the process. It seems Cutler's irrational attachment to his son caused his downfall. So maybe the Cybermen have a point about emotions being a weakness. The Doctor realises that Mondas is unintentionally absorbing all the energy from the Earth, and that it will soon absorb too much energy and disintegrate. Why? We don't know. The Doctor offers the Cybermen one last chance to live in peace with the humans of Earth, but they refuse his offer. Exploiting Ben's emotions, the Cybermen threaten to kill Polly and the Doctor, and take them as hostages to their spaceship. Keep back! Keep away from me! The Cybermen then force Ben and the scientists to move the Z-bomb to the basement so that they can detonate it underground, which will destroy the Earth and stop Mondas from drawing too much energy. Since they'll all die anyway when the bomb detonates, why the scientists want to go along with this plan, we don't know. Ben wonders why the Cybermen aren't moving the bomb themselves since they're super strong, and he realises that the Cybermen are vulnerable to radiation. He convinces the scientists to fight back, and using handheld uranium rods from the base's reactor, they hold off the Cybermen and prevent them from detonating the bomb. The planet Mondas begins to disintegrate as it absorbs too much energy from the Earth, and as it breaks apart, all the Cybermen on Earth die, withering away without the energy from their homeworld. The world rejoices, and Cutler's son returns safely to Earth. Ben heads to the Cyberman ship to free Polly and the Doctor, but he finds the Doctor slumped over in his chair, sickly and weak. Clearly something is very wrong. Hey, come on, Doctor! Wakey-wakey! It's all over now! What did you say, my boy? It's all over. It's all over! That's what you said! Ah, from being all over. The group head back to the TARDIS. The Doctor seems almost possessed as his hands dance across the console. He forces himself to operate the door controls to allow Ben and Polly inside. Ben and Polly enter the TARDIS to find the Doctor collapsed on the floor. They rush to his side just in time to see a bright light as the Doctor's face begins to change. Just like the Cybermen changed their bodies when they became weak, the Doctor has done the same. But who is this new Doctor? We don't know. Yet. It's over. <laughs> Having seen the Doctor's appearance change before their eyes, Ben and Polly soon realised that the Doctor's personality has changed too. Life depends on change and renewal. Oh, so that's it. You've been renewed, have you? I've been renewed, have I? That's it. I've been renewed. It's part of the TARDIS. 
Without it, I couldn't survive. Polly is more accepting of the new doctor, but Ben is far more suspicious. What he said in the tracking room. Something about this old body of mine is wearing a bit thin. So he gets himself a new one? To be fair, the doctor doesn't seem entirely sure who he is either. The doctor was a great collector, wasn't he? But you're the doctor. Oh, I don't look like him. The doctor roots around the TARDIS and finds his predecessor's diary and a musical recorder before heading outside for a look around. The TARDIS has arrived on the planet Vulcan. No, not that Vulcan. The Doctor takes a stroll around the Mercury swamps and witnesses the murder of an examiner from Earth who has been sent to investigate the human colony here on Vulcan. The Doctor pretends to be the examiner himself and he, Ben and Polly are escorted back to the colony by Quinn, the colony's deputy governor, and Bregan, the head of security. All is not well at the colony, and a group of rebels have been plotting to overthrow the colony's governor. The colony has found a 200-year-old spaceship in the Mercury Swamp, and it's being analysed by a scientist called Lesterson. Yes, any idea. Good night. We'll see you up to now. The Doctor gains entry to the spaceship and finds two apparently dead Daleks. and a very much alive Dalek outside its casing. The Doctor notices that there should have been a third Dalek in there, and it turns out that Lesterson is in the process of secretly reviving it by giving it power. Of course, as soon as the Dalek wakes up, it shoots and kills one of the scientists. So Lesterson sensibly removes the Dalek's gun, but his assistant lies to him about the scientist being killed so Lesterson carries on reviving the Dalek regardless. One Dalek, yes. All that is needed to wipe out this entire colony. Time for a musical interlude. <laughs> so the murdered man was the real examiner. The Doctor tries to convince the colony's governor, Hensel, that the Daleks are evil and should be destroyed, but Hensel is having none of it because the Daleks offer to work for the humans. Do for our processing packaging. Processing what? Blocked toilets? Think what it would mean if we were to set it to work in the mines. It could double our production overnight. What's it going to do in the mines? Suction cup the minerals off the wall? Anyway, the colonists think that they can control the Daleks by restricting the amount of electrical power that they provide to the Daleks, because of course the Daleks need energy to live. Daleks. I know the misery they cause. The Doctor tries to call Earth to warn them about the Daleks here, since he's still pretending to be the Earth Examiner. But someone has attacked a technician and sabotaged the planet's communications array. The sabotage gets blamed on the Deputy Governor, Quinn, and Bregan locks him up. Musical interlude. So now there's a dead scientist and a technician's been attacked. The colony's communications relay has been sabotaged. The deputy governor is in jail. There's Daleks driving around the city. There's a rebel group gaining power and a government examiner has just arrived to inspect the place. So the governor says, see ya, and goes on a tour of the colony's perimeter, leaving Bregan, his head of security, in charge. No wonder the rebels want to overthrow this guy. Presumably because the governor is an idiot, the rebels want to use the Daleks to help them take over the colony, so the rebels kidnap Polly and warn the Doctor and Ben that they won't see her again unless they stop trying to get rid of the Daleks. The Daleks promise to make a computer for the colonists that can predict meteor movements with 100% accuracy. I wonder if that's the same 100% accurate computer that crashed the Dalek spaceship into the Mercury Swamp. The colonists really want the new computers, so they give the Daleks materials and lay power cables all around the building so that the Daleks can move around freely. But the sneaky Daleks use the materials instead to build more Daleks. Nine complete. Check. Dalek. Ten complete. Check. We will get a power. We will get a power. Musical interlude. 
But why don't you stop blowing that thing and talk to us properly? Ben. Now don't you stop. Bregan is now in charge of the colony and he reveals that he killed the Earth Examiner, so he knows that the Doctor is an imposter. Bregan locks up the Doctor with the wrongfully imprisoned Deputy Governor Quinn, but the Doctor escapes by playing his recorder and accidentally unlocking the sonic lock on the cell door. Maybe the Doctor should consider permanently carrying a sonic device with him for exactly this kind of situation. It turns out that Bregan was also the leader of the rebels all along. When the real governor returns from his jolly around the perimeter, Bregan kills him to keep his position as the new governor. And if Bregan wasn't already villainous enough, he also decides to kill all the other rebels, because it's only a matter of time before they rebel against him, right? The rebels overhear Bregan plotting against them, though. So now the rebels want to use the Daleks to take over the colony, and Bregan wants to use the Daleks to get rid of the rebels. The Daleks, however, have their own agenda. Now that there are power cables all around the city, the Daleks can roam free and begin exterminating everyone they can find. In the fighting, Bregan is killed by one of the rebels. The rebels decide they don't need to hold Polly captive anymore, so the Doctor grabs Ben and Polly and sneaks through the battle to get to the lab where the Dalek spaceship is, and he finds Lesterson there, who has undergone a mental breakdown in the wake of the Dalek uprising. In the lab, Lesterson tells the Doctor that there's a secret master cable that the Daleks are using to draw power from the colony's main generator, so the Doctor starts tinkering with the Daleks' power supply. The Daleks arrive to stop him though, but Lesterson, who feels responsible for the whole situation, sacrifices himself to buy the Doctor enough time to finish sabotaging the Daleks' power supply, which obviously causes all the Daleks to explode! You used the power from the colonists' electric supply, overfed it and blew up their temporary static circuit. Well, didn't you? Did I do all that? The Doctor, Ben and Polly head back to the TARDIS, and as they dematerialise, the eye stalk on an exploded Dalek nearby begins to twitch. <laughs> The TARDIS arrives in Scotland in the mid-18th century. The Doctor, Ben and Polly emerge from the TARDIS to hear the sounds of battle and narrowly avoid getting hit by a cannonball. They are in the aftermath of the Battle of Culloden and the Doctor wants to leave but surprisingly Polly and Ben want to stay to have a look around, presumably to find some souvenirs? I would like a hat like this. The travellers soon get captured by a group of Scottish Highlanders and taken to a nearby cottage. Amongst the Scots is a young man called Jamie McCrimmon. More on him later. The Scots hear the English accents and immediately want to execute the Doctor and his companions, but the Scottish laird, Colin McLaren, has been injured in the battle and the Doctor says that he can help to save his life. Polly and the laird's daughter, Kirsty, go off to get some fresh water for the injured laird. Ben grabs a gun and holds the Scots at gunpoint, but the Doctor tells him to put the gun down which he does, reluctantly, and loudly, because the gun accidentally goes off as Ben puts it on the table. You'd think being a soldier in the British Navy, Ben would know to be a bit careful when handling firearms. The gunfire draws the attention of nearby English soldiers, who kill the laird's son Alexander and threaten to hang Ben, the Doctor and the Scotsman. To try to avoid the hanging, the Doctor pretends to be a German. Dr. Van Veer, at your service. Doctor Who? That's what I said. Unimpressed by the Doctor's story and his German accent, the British soldiers go ahead with the hanging anyway. But it's interrupted at the last minute by an English slave trader, a former solicitor called Solicitor Grey, who takes prisoners of war and sells them to the colonies in the West Indies. Meanwhile, Polly and Kirsty get hunted by an English officer called Lieutenant Algernon Finch, with two Fs. 
Polly tries to rescue the Doctor and Ben, but unfortunately she and Kirsty fall down a big hole, presumably made to trap animals. And then Lieutenant Fafinch falls down the hole too. Never fear, Algernon Thomas Fafinch. All in the hole together, Polly and Kirsty grab Finch's gun and take all his money. They climb out of the hole and tell Finch that if he goes after them again, they'll make a laughing stock of him. I bet the Colonel would be highly interested to hear how his Lieutenant for Finch was captured by two girls. You would not tell. Oh, wouldn't we? Give me the knife, Kirsty. The Doctor, Ben, and the other Scottish prisoners are imprisoned aboard a ship called the Annabelle, ready to be taken to the West Indies and sold as slaves. Uh, <laughs> man! <clears throat> yeah, I didn't think we'd have the last of that. <laughs> the English redcoats are looking for Bonnie Prince Charlie, an ally of the Scots trying to overthrow the English monarchy. The Doctor discovers that the Scottish laird has Prince Charles a standard hidden under his clothes, so the Doctor takes it to Grey, the slave trader, and pretends he knows where Charlie is hiding. The Doctor uses this distraction to steal a pistol and lock up Grey in a cupboard. I'm not very expert with these things, and it just might go off in your face. The Doctor also manages to subdue Grey's assistant by bashing his head on a table. You suffer from headaches? Uh, no, I don't. Oh! Oh, dear. No headaches? Well, what? Oh! Oh, dear. You call me a liar? No, 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 no. Me head does, eh? Of course it does. What do you expect? The Doctor escapes the ship and assumes another disguise, this time an old woman. Polly and Kirsty are in the local tavern once again tormenting Lieutenant Finch, and they meet up with the Doctor there purely by chance. The three of them decide to buy weapons with Finch's money. Back on the ship, the slave traders are trying to get their prisoners to sign a dodgy contract so that they can legitimately be sold as slaves. But Ben rips up the stack of contracts and gets himself tied up and thrown overboard. <laughs> Fortunately, Ben is a professional sailor, and he knows an old Houdini trick for getting himself untied. So he escapes and swims to shore, where he meets the Doctor, who is now disguised as an English soldier to distract the guards while Polly and Kirsty fill a rowboat with weapons. Polly and Kirsty row out to the ship and pass the weapons to the Scottish prisoners through the porthole. The Doctor convinces Solicitor Grey that the young Scotsman Jamie in the hold is actually Prince Charles. But when Grey and his men go down to the hold to investigate, the armed prisoners jump up and a fight ensues for control of the ship. The Scotsmen take control of the ship, Kirsty is reunited with her father, and the Scotsmen sail the ship off to the safety of France. The Doctor Ben and Polly then take Grey as a hostage, and Jamie as a guide to help them get back to the TARDIS. But Grey escapes, so they again convince Finch's superior officer that they know where the prince is hiding, and that Finch should go with them to guarantee them safe passage across the dangerous highlands. Dash it, I haven't had a wink of sleep yet. Oh, you poor thing. Go on. On their way back, Grey catches up with them, but Polly has told Finch all about Grey's slave trade operation. Grey, of course, protests that it was all legal and tries to produce signed contracts as proof. But the Doctor has pickpocketed the contracts, so Finch has Grey arrested. The group eventually arrive back at the TARDIS, and Polly seems to be very grateful for Finch's help. Jamie's clanmates have already left on the ship to France, so Jamie will soon be all alone on the highlands, surrounded by English soldiers. So Polly suggests maybe he could go with them. Doctor, can we take him with us? If he teaches me to play the bagpipes. If you want, Doctor. Oh, that's all we need. Come, Come on, Jamie. On. But where are we going? You'll see. Jamie, not really sure what he's getting himself into, apprehensively steps inside the TARDIS. The TARDIS arrives on a volcanic island on Earth, probably somewhere around the late 20th century. There's no sign of life, however, so the travellers muse that they might be in prehistoric times. Cavemen? Hey, Jamie, you better watch it. With that kill, someone might mistake you for a bird. What? <laughs> Before long, the Doctor, Jamie, Ben and Polly are captured and taken deep underground below sea level to the lost city of Atlantis where they find an ancient civilization of Atlanteans who all seem to have massive eyebrows. 
The Atlanteans think that the arrival of the travellers is the fulfilment of an ancient prophecy, so obviously they decide to feed them all to the sharks. But before they become fish food, the Atlanteans give the travellers some refreshments. I mean, you can't get eaten by a shark on an empty stomach now, can you? The doctor realises that the delicious plankton-based food could only have been created by a Professor Zaroff, so the doctor writes him a note. Vital secret will die with me, Dr W. I wonder what the W stands for. Anyway, after everyone's had lunch, the Atlanteans go ahead with the shark food plan. <laughs> Fortunately, Professor Zaroff gets the note and arrives just in time to save everyone. But you have sense of humour. I too have sense of humour. I need men like you. <laughs> you come with me, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Professor Zaroff is not a native Atlantean, but he has promised the Atlanteans that he can raise Atlantis to the ocean's surface once again, and he wants the Doctor's help. The Doctor soon realises, however, that it's impossible to raise Atlantis. You know, because being a city, it's quite heavy. Zaroff, who is quite mad, wants to drill a hole in the Earth's crust to drain the ocean down the hole to the Earth's core. So, technically, Atlantis would no longer be under the ocean, but the superheated steam would crack the Earth open like a, a jug on an incense burner? Zaroff intends to raise Atlantis, but in little pieces. The Atlanteans have no idea that the Earth will blow up if Zaroff is successful, but this seems to be Zaroff's plan all along. Just one small question. Why do you want to blow up the world? Why? You, a scientist, ask me why? The achievement, my dear doctor. The destruction of the world. The scientist's dream of supreme power. Musical interlude. The Atlanteans send Ben and Jamie into the mines to work on digging the hole to the Earth's core. And they decide that if they can't turn Polly into fish food, they'll have to settle for turning her into a fish. You're not turning me into a fish! The Atlanteans are surgically altering people so that they can breathe underwater through gills. These fish people are treated like slaves and are forced to catch fish and operate the plankton farms that feed Atlantis. <laughs> Fortunately, Polly is saved when the Doctor causes a power cut by tinkering in Zaroff's lab. By explaining some science, the Doctor manages to convince the super-religious Atlanteans that Zaroff actually wants to blow up the Earth. But when confronted, Zaroff shoots the Atlantean leader. Kill those two men! Nothing in the world can stop me now! Meanwhile, Ben and Jamie make some friends in the mines and find out that the mine workers are actually shipwrecked crews the Atlanteans have kidnapped. And while Ben and Jamie are forced to do slave labour in the mines, Polly does a bit of shopping at the local marketplace. After a bit of running around... Stop it! The Doctor decides the only way to stop Zaroff is to flood the lower levels of Atlantis, so he warns the Atlanteans first and then collapses the sea walls by sabotaging their generator. You'd think they'd have a backup for that, wouldn't you? But the Doctor's too late anyway. Zaroff's plan is ready to commence, and all Zaroff has to do is press a plunger at the exact right moment, which will pull out the Earth's bath plug and drain the ocean down to the Earth's core. The Doctor and Ben try to stop Zaroff, but Zaroff blocks them by putting a metal grill down between them. So the Doctor turns out the lights in the lab, so Zaroff can't see the dial that tells him when to press the plunger. Oh, if only he'd automated it. Zaroff raises the metal grill and comes out with a gun to turn the lights back on. So Ben sneaks around the back and lowers the metal grill again, rolling underneath it just as it slams shut. Zaroff is now trapped on the wrong side of the grill, unable to reach the controls that would destroy the Earth. No! You cannot do this to me! I 
Since Atlantis is now flooding, the Doctor goes back to try to save Zaroff, but Zaroff refuses to leave and drowns reaching for the controls. The lower half of Atlantis is flooded, but the Atlanteans still have half an underwater city left, and they consider rebuilding. No. No more temples. It was temples and priests and superstition that made us follow Zaroff in the first place. But we will have enough left to build a new Atlantis. Without gods. And without fish people. With a half-destroyed city, half the population homeless, no way of creating enough food to feed everyone, and an angry former slave labour force to deal with, I'm sure they'll be just fine. Polly, Jamie, Ben and the Doctor all climb to the surface and head back to the TARDIS. The TARDIS is violently pulled off course whilst the Doctor is trying to prove that he can actually pilot it. They have arrived on the Earth's moon in the year 2070. After suiting up, they decide to go for a bounce in the low gravity, but Jamie bangs his head and knocks himself unconscious after an overambitious bounce. Fortunately, there's a nearby moon base they can go to for help. The moon base is home to a multinational group of scientists. Look, you can tell that guy's French because of his neck scarf. The scientists look after the Gravitron, a machine that manipulates gravity to control the weather on Earth, and that's what caused the TARDIS's bumpy landing. Jamie is taken to the sick bay, and they discover that the scientists have recently been affected by a mysterious virus. The doctor tries to find the cure for the virus. I mean, he is a doctor after all, right? Yes, I, I think I was once. So. Polly, I think I took a degree once in Glasgow, 1888, I think. Lister, hold that for me, will you? He does this mostly by nicking people's shoes, but Polly soon discovers firsthand the most likely suspects. <coughs> the Cybermen are on the moon, and they're abducting the virus victims. There are some corners of the universe which have bred the most terrible things. Things which act against everything that we believe in. They must be fought. The Cybermen have been sneaking into the moon base through the storeroom. Wait, does that hole lead straight out to the moon? Wouldn't you need like an airlock or something? Oh, it's okay, he's blocking it back up with bags of sugar. The scientists search the base but they don't find any Cybermen. But the Doctor realises there's one place they haven't looked. The Cyberman-shaped bulge under the blanket in the sick bay. Only stupid earth brains like yours would have been fooled. The Cybermen quickly take control of the base and mind control the infected humans, forcing them to mess up the weather on Earth. We are here to take over the Ravitron and use it to destroy the surface of the Earth by changing the weather. But that will kill everybody on the Earth! Yes. But why do the Cybermen want to kill all the humans? To eliminate all dangers. We do not possess feelings. The Doctor wonders why the Cybermen don't just kill the scientists and operate the Gravitron themselves. And it's a good question that never gets answered. Clever, clever, clever. Oh, he's crashed. Someone switch him off and on again. Polly realises that the Cybermen are partly plastic, which can be melted with solvents. So Ben helps her mix up a cocktail of solvents to spray the Cybermen with. I mean, she couldn't have done that without a man's help, could she? But not you, Polly. This is men's work. Bit sexist, Ben. I'm coming with you and that's flat. Damn straight. Polly, Ben and Jamie now run around squirting the Cybermen with the Polly cocktail, which essentially melts them all. The Cybermen aren't giving up though, they still have mind-controlled humans on the base, who use the Gravitron to deflect an Earth relief ship into the sun. They also have reinforcements. Lots of reinforcements. And a massive laser gun. But fortunately, the Gravitron deflects the laser beams. That's right, put it back in the box. I hope you kept the receipt.
The Cybermen do eventually smash a window, but the scientists block it with a shirt and a drinks tray. I hope NASA's taking notes here. Seeing no alternative, the Doctor points the Gravitron at the Moon's surface, causing all of the Cybermen to float away into space. <laughs> I'm sure that's the last we'll see of them. Well, that's taken care of the Cybermen! As the scientists celebrate, the Doctor and his companions slip away and head back to the TARDIS. And the Doctor... What the... <laughs> oh, well, perhaps it's just as well. We've got enough madmen here already. Looking for spoilers, the Doctor uses the time scanner aboard the TARDIS to see into the future. Doctor? Mm -hmm. Look! Macra. Whoops, nope, too far. On the scanner, they see a terrifying crab claw. The TARDIS arrives. Well, I'm actually not sure where it arrives. Well, according to my calculations, we're uh, certainly in the future and uh, on a planet very like the Earth. How do you know? I don't know, I'm guessing. After they leave the TARDIS, a man called Medoc bumps into them whilst running away from the local police. Being a stand-up citizen, Ben tackles Medoc and hands him over to the police chief, Ola. They all head to a nearby colony, which is apparently an idyllic place full of happy people. We're the gang that works the hardest and we must obey. Obey control, ring the bell. Hurrah, rah, rah. Rah, rah, rah. Rah, rah, rah. Work well. Ring the bell. Oh, that's much better, but we'll do it again and this time with more feeling. Oh, no, please don't do it again. The colony's leader, who calls himself the Pilot, thanks the Doctor for apprehending Medoc the criminal, and the travellers are offered various spa facilities including steam baths, haircuts, and creepy pickup lines. Oh, very nice. Very nice indeed. You must certainly be the most beautiful young lady in our colony, and are quite sure to be elected our next beauty president. Thank you very much. You're not at all. It's all part of our service. The Doctor would prefer to stay looking like a cosmic hobo, though, so he goes off to speak to Medoc, who is now a prisoner in a rehabilitation facility. Medoc claims to have discovered the colony's secret, that there are terrifying creatures that come out at night. So the Doctor breaks him out of jail, and later that night, the two of them come face to face with a giant crab-like creature, the Macra. Meanwhile, the colonists attempt to brainwash Polly, Jamie and Ben whilst they are asleep. The leaders of the colony know what is best. You must obey orders. But it only works on Ben before the doctor arrives and puts a stop to it. My advice to you is don't do anything of the sort. Don't just be obedient. Always make up your own mind. The citizens of the colony are all brainwashed, and they get their orders from the controller, who appears as a big handsome face on a screen. Hey, who's that? He looks smashing. <laughs> yes, he might look nice, but there are a few red flags in the way that he acts. No one on the colony believes in Mecra. There is no such thing as Mecra. Mecra do not exist. There are no Mecra. If there's no such thing as Macra, then what's this giant crab thing that's trying to eat Polly? Since the Doctor has now broken several laws, he, Polly and Jamie are sent to work in the colony's dangerous gas mines. The Macra need a specific type of gas to live, so they have been brainwashing the colonists into mining it for them. The Macra have convinced the colonists that they are happy and fulfilled, while in reality they are being exploited. Jamie tries to escape from the mines but gets trapped in some old mine shafts and hunted by several Macra. Fortunately, he's able to beat them off with a stick. The Doctor finds the Macra's control room deep beneath the colony and he manages to convince the pilot that the Macra are in fact real by showing him the truth. You haven't been in touch with Control, but with these. Did the pilot see them? Yes, I saw the Macra. It is forbidden to say that. Don't let him say that he has seen Macra. I saw you. You are the Macra. Silence! 
Now that the colony's leader is on Team Doctor, the Macra give control of the colony to Police Chief Ola, who locks them all up and tries to kill them with poisonous Macra gas. But, seeing his friends in danger, Ben breaks free of his brainwashing and comes to their rescue. Ben locks himself in the gas pumping room and the doctor instructs him to turn up the inflow and the outflow of gas to the macra's chamber, which increases the pressure and causes a massive explosion, killing all the macra beneath the colony. The colonists are now free of the macra's control and they inform the travellers that there will be an annual dance competition held in their honour. And they also want the Doctor to be the new leader of their colony, so the Doctor decides it's time to return to the TARDIS. So the next time someone says Big Brother is watching you, remember, he might just be a giant crab. The TARDIS arrives in London at Gatwick Airport in 1967. It's a flying beastie! Since the TARDIS is blocking a runway, the police soon arrive to remove it. Scatter! Whilst running from the cops, Polly hides in a warehouse and witnesses a Chameleon Tours employee shooting a police inspector with a ray gun. <coughs> Polly tells the doctor what she's seen, but before long she gets kidnapped by the murderer. <coughs> the doctor and Jamie spend quite a lot of time trying to convince the airport commandant that there's been a murder. She was electrocuted with a ray gun. A what? Oh. Ben snoops around a bit, and then he gets kidnapped too. It turns out that the employees of the Chameleon Tours airline are actually aliens, and they're using their holiday tour company to abduct young humans. There was some kind of catastrophe on the aliens' home planet, which means that the aliens are now in a vegetative state where they've become featureless, mindless beings with no personality of their own. Maybe they'd fit in better in a reality TV show than an airport. The aliens have developed a technology that allows them to assume the identity and appearance of a human host, which allows them to have a much better quality of life than they would have had in their vegetative state. The aliens have kidnapped and stolen the identity of key personnel around the airport, including the excellently named Captain Blade, who is sadly just a pilot and not a pirate. And they've also made a copy of Polly. Polly? My name isn't Polly. You must have made a mistake. I've never seen them before in my life. The Doctor tries to figure out what the aliens are up to, and in the process he gets himself arrested, then trapped in a room with freezing gas, then electrocuted by a small device attached to his back, then he almost gets chopped in half by a diabolical James Bond-style slow-moving laser. Why the aliens didn't just shoot him with the ray gun, I don't know. Well, if we knew that, we wouldn't be sitting here. Whilst the Doctor is escaping from poorly conceived traps and investigating the aliens, Jamie is making friends with some of the locals. OK, calm down. What Jamie is really doing here is stealing this lady's ticket so that he can board one of the Chameleon Tours air flights to find out what's going on. On board the flight, Jamie discovers that the aeroplane is actually a spaceship in disguise. And that's not all. The whole plane is also a shrinking chamber. See for yourself. The aliens are kidnapping everyone that gets on their flights, miniaturising them, and then taking them to their space station, which apparently nobody has noticed hovering around in low orbit above an airport. The aliens have just finished collecting enough humans, and now they have 50,000 young people miniaturised and stored on the space station to take back to their homeworld for copying. So there are 50,000 people who have gone missing all on the same airline, but there isn't really that much concern about it on Earth for some reason. So the Doctor pretends to be an alien copy of himself to get on the last flight from Earth to the alien space station, but he quickly gets found out to be an imposter or technically he's found out to not be an imposter. On Earth, the police and Jamie's new girlfriend find the original bodies of all the airport staff that the aliens have copied. The aliens had been hiding them in cars in the airport car park. They obviously didn't think it was necessary to put them in the boot or hide them or anything. The Doctor tells the aliens that they must return all the miniaturised humans back to Earth, or the airport staff will start removing the control devices attached to their originals in the car park. 
and if the control devices are removed before the personality transfer is complete, it will kill whichever alien copied them. Why the aliens didn't take these originals with them seems like a massive oversight in their plan. Maybe it was arrogance, or maybe the alien leader just didn't care if a bunch of his fellow aliens died. Either way, the humans demonstrate that they mean business by removing one of the control devices in the car park. On board the space station, which is also a spaceship, one of the aliens dissolves into a pile of goo, so the aliens who still have originals on Earth take control of the space station. The Doctor negotiates with them, and they agree to release all of their miniaturised captives, and to return to their natural vegetative states, which will free the original humans on Earth. The Doctor also promises to help the alien scientists to find a permanent cure for their condition. Polly and Ben are returned to their normal sizes, and surprisingly, Ben didn't ask for a couple of extra inches. Polly and Ben realise that today is the exact same date that they left with the first Doctor during the incident with the war machines. It's as if we've never been away! You really want to go, don't you? Well, we won't leave Doctor if you really need us. The thing is, it, it is our world. Yes, I know. You're lucky. I never got back to mine. All right, then. Off you go. The Doctor and Jamie say goodbye to Ben and an emotional Polly. And then they realise that the TARDIS has been stolen. The TARDIS has been stolen by a man called Edward Waterfield. Waterfield has scattered elaborate cryptic clues all over London to lure the Doctor and Jamie to his Victorian antique shop. One of the clues is a bloke in a warehouse who's been paid to send them looking for a company that doesn't exist. One of the clues involves a large sum of money and a dead body. Another clue leads them to a coffee bar, where Jamie looks for more clues, by flirting with some local girls. In the coffee bar, Waterfield's assistant arrives and tells the Doctor and Jamie to head to his boss's antique shop if they want the TARDIS back. In fact, thinking about it, he probably could have skipped all the cryptic clues and just done that to start with. The Doctor discovers that the antiques in Waterfield's shop aren't antiques at all, they're brand new. But how does Waterfield get brand new Victorian items in 1966? Waterfield has a time machine. And who gave Waterfield a time machine? So why have the Daleks set up a Victorian antiques shop in London in 1966? We actually never find out. After the Daleks do a bit of exterminating of the antique shop's employees, Waterfield gasses the Doctor and Jamie and puts them in his time machine to send them back 100 years to 1866. Waterfield is originally from 1866. He's been conducting scientific experiments with another man called Maxtable, who is obsessed with trying to turn common metals into gold. Maxtable also has a giant portrait of Waterfield's wife in his living room, which is really creepy. Anyway, in one of their experiments, Waterfield and Maxtable filled a closet with mirrors and then pumped static electricity into the mirrors, because, you know, Victorian science. Apparently, this crazy experiment summoned the Daleks, and now the closet is acting like a time machine itself. The Daleks promised Maxtable the secret of how to turn metal into gold, and in exchange Maxtable would work for the Daleks, although what Maxtable actually did for them is unclear. So why did the Daleks go to all this pointless trouble to lure the Doctor to Maxtable's house in 1866? Well, the Daleks are sick of being defeated. Not by the Doctor, no, they're apparently quite happy to be defeated by him. No, they're sick of being defeated by humans. Guess we must have missed all those stories. Anyway, the Daleks want the Doctor to figure out what makes humans so special, and then they want him to transplant the human factor into a bunch of Daleks. The Doctor has no choice but to obey, because the Daleks have the TARDIS. The Daleks have also kidnapped Waterfield's daughter, Victoria, and they want a prime human specimen to attempt to rescue her. Their plan is to closely monitor the rescue attempt so that the Doctor can identify the human factor. So where can they find a prime human specimen to attempt the rescue? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't mean to wake you. 
After Jamie's finished flirting with Maxtable's maid, the doctor manipulates Jamie into rescuing Victoria. Don't you try to be a one-man army. You leave well alone. I won't have you ruining everything trying to rescue Victoria Waterfield. Now you understand? Jamie thinks that the Doctor has started working for the Daleks, so he completely ignores the Doctor's advice and begins the Daleks' assault course. The Daleks fought The Daleks! They keep telling me about the Daleks, but I haven't even seen one! You're always on about them, but where are they? Are you listening No! To me? You'll not get around me this time, Doctor! Well, you can all stand around doing nothing! I'm sick to death of it! But just where are you going? To be by myself for a bit. Do you mind? The assault course consists of some classic traps like a secret door and some spikes on sticks, but the biggest threat is probably this giant Turkish wrestler called Kemal. Kemal has been instructed to stop Jamie at all costs, so a fight breaks out, which Jamie wins by tricking Kemal into running through an open door and falling off a roof. Being a compassionate soul though, Jamie then saves Kemal and turns him from foe into friend mainly by flirting with him. Together? I will go together. There's no one I'd rather have with me. Jamie and Kemmel finish the assault course by taking out a couple of Daleks, by, you know, pushing them into walls or off a balcony. They finally reach Victoria, but before they can free her, she's kidnapped again by a man called Terrell, who is dating Maxtable's daughter. The Daleks are also mind-controlling Terrell with a machine attached to his neck, which also makes him schizophrenic, afraid of food, and literally magnetic. His girlfriend, Maxtable's daughter, weirdly hasn't noticed any of this. Well, maybe she thinks it's an improvement. Analyzing Jamie's kind of successful rescue of Victoria has given the Doctor everything he needs to identify the human factor. The human factor? Well, a part of it at least, the, the better part. Courage, pity, chivalry, friendship, even compassion. Some of the virtues. In there? Yes, it's a positronic brain. So the Doctor goes ahead and implants the human factor into several Daleks, which turns the Daleks into playful children. They're taking me for a ride! Jamie! They're playing a game! It's a game! Fred! Hello! Oh, how the mighty have fallen. The Doctor frees Terrell from the Daleks' control and tells everyone in the house to leave immediately. Which is really fortunate, because right after that, the Daleks decide they've got everything they need now and prepare to blow up the house and everyone in it by setting a bomb with a really long timer. The Daleks take Victoria, Maxtable and Kemmel through the mirror closet and back to their homeworld, Scarrow. Although I'm not sure why. The Doctor and Jamie use the Daleks' original time machine from the antique shop to get to Scarrow, because that's where the TARDIS is. Waterfield also goes with them to save his daughter, and, you know, to avoid getting blown up. On Scarrow, it isn't long before the Doctor and co. get captured and locked up with the other humans. And then the Doctor comes face to face with the Dalek Emperor. Doctor! Look at the size of that thing! So, you are the Doctor! We meet at last. I wondered if we ever would. The Emperor explains that his overly complicated plan wasn't to get the human factor after all. He actually wanted to identify the Dalek factor all along. The human factor showed us what the Dalek factor was! What? They wanted to know how humans were different from Daleks, so that they could go back into Earth's past and infect the human race with the Dalek Factor. They will be impregnated with the Dalek Factor! Wait, impregnate? Ooh, what would those babies look like? I mean, how would they even get the... Actually, it's probably best not to think about that too much. What is the Dalek Factor? Do you want me to guess? It means to obey, to fight, to destroy, to exterminate. The Daleks create an archway that infects any humans that walk through it with the Dalek Factor. The Daleks then offer Maxtable a machine that turns metal into gold, but it's actually an elaborate trick to get him to walk through the archway. 
Oh, they could push us through any time they like. Yeah, actually, that is a good point, Jamie. Impregnated with the Dalek factor, Maxtable is now obedient to the Daleks and exhibiting lots of classic Dalek traits. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Daleks that the Doctor infected with the human factor have begun to question orders. Eventually, the Doctor is forced to walk through the archway, and for a moment it looks like he's been impregnated with the Dalek factor himself. But the process was designed for humans. Well, why didn't it affect you then? I don't come from Earth, Jamie. Since some Daleks are exhibiting human-like qualities, the Dalek Emperor decides all the Daleks should go through the archway to re-impregnate them with the Dalek factor. The Doctor, who is now pretending to be on Team Dalek, switches the archway to deliver the human factor instead of the Dalek factor. So loads more Daleks are impregnated with the human factor before the Emperor realises what's going on. A Dalek civil war breaks out between the human Daleks and the Dalek Daleks. Do not fight in here! In the battle, the Emperor is destroyed. I think we've seen the end of the Daleks forever. Yeah, right. The Doctor frees the prisoners and they make their way through the Dalek-on-Dalek -Dalek battle raging throughout the city. One Dalek tries to shoot the Doctor, but Waterfield feels he needs to make amends for all the trouble he's caused by working with the Daleks, so he jumps in the way of the shot, saving the Doctor's life. Yes, a good life to save. Just outside the city, Dalek Maxtable catches up with them and pushes poor Kemmel off a cliff, and then he returns to the city, presumably so that he can die in the fighting. The Doctor, Jamie and Victoria find the TARDIS, which the Daleks have conveniently left lying around outside the city. Victoria is now homeless and orphaned, and the Doctor and Jamie promised Waterfield that they would look after his daughter. So they invite Victoria to join them in the TARDIS. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.